Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorized into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water, or secret. In this series, I'll be going through and analyzing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video, we're going to be looking at the lightning element, home to the ceratopsian dinosaurs. They are typically shown using their horns, essentially like lightning rods, to control and manipulate electricity to their advantage in battle, which makes for a really cool visual. The ceratopsians are reconstructed with four fingers and four toes with claws on every digit and all of them bearing weight. However, they should have five fingers and only the innermost three should have claws. The outermost two were vestigial and didn't touch the ground. Whilst they did have four toes and each had a claw, the outermost toe wasn't used for walking. All the Ceratopsians in Dinosaur King are from the late Cretaceous, which makes sense since that's when the group was most diverse. The first dinosaur we're going to look at is Eudanoceratops, meaning Eudan's horned face, after the region of Mongolia where it was found in rock dated to roughly 75 million years ago. It's actually the only Asian Ceratopsian in the franchise, with all the others being from North America. Ironically, this genus didn't have the group's famous horns, as it was a leptoceratopsid, a family of smaller ceratopsians which lacked the elaborate head ornamentation of their larger relatives, the ceratopsids. That being said, Eudanoceratops was actually the largest leptoceratopsid by a considerable margin. Its head was especially huge and probably very powerful. The only issue I can see, aside from the ones I mentioned earlier, which are universal across the group and I won't bring up again, is that its head frill may be too tall. I'm really glad they included an obscure basal ceratopsian, as they rarely get much love in the media, especially since it's really good. Next up we have another basal ceratopsian, Zuni ceratops, meaning Zuni horned face after the Zuni basin in New Mexico where it was discovered. It wasn't a true ceratopsid, but was close to their ancestry. Dating to around 90 million years ago, it's actually the oldest ceratopsian in the franchise, as all the others come from younger rock dated to around 83 to 66 million years ago. As for the actual model, the frill looks to be the perfect shape based on the fossil skull. The horns might be too short, as the keratin sheath they would have had in life would likely make the horns longer than just the fossilized bone core. The tail, conversely, seems to be too long and should probably droop. Otherwise though, this one's pretty good. This brings us to the true Ceratopsidae family. The Dinosaur King models seem to have tails that are either too long or just too straight. Unlike most dinosaurs, Ceratopsid's hips were angled downwards, making the tail appear to have a negative curve. The Ceratopsidae can be divided into two subfamilies, Centrosaurines and Chasmosaurines. The first Centrosaurine we'll be looking at is Alberta Ceratops, meaning Alberta horned face, after the Canadian province where it was discovered in rock dated to roughly 70 7 million years ago. This genus has a really weird exception to the general ceratopsid issues I listed earlier, as the TCG art has the correct number of fingers with five, albeit still with the wrong number of claws, as well as having its toes in the correct positions. I don't know why this one piece of artwork was altered to be much more accurate, but it's good? The nasal horn is actually not a horn, but rather a bony ridge, and it's represented appropriately on this model. It has prominent brow horns, which is unusual for centrosaurines, which are thought to have gradually lost them over time, suggesting Alberta ceratops is a basal member. The first pair of parietal horns on the frill are very broad and appropriately strongly curved outwards, with the rest being much smaller and gradually shrinking towards the bottom of the frill. For the time, this model's excellent. 
Next up, we have three for the price of one, Centrosaurus, Eucentrosaurus, and Monoclonius. They were all discovered in the USA and Canada in rock dates to around 76 million years ago. I'm lumping these three together as that's exactly what science did. The latter two are now considered synonyms of Centrosaurus. Monoclonius, meaning single sprout, is now considered by most researchers to be a junior synonym of Centrosaurus. Centrosaurus, however, was a result of confusion from the naming of the stegosaur Kentrosaurus by Edwin Hennig in 1915. Both Centrosaurus and Kentrosaurus get their names from the Greek word Kentron, meaning sharp point. As such, both genera ended up meaning sharp pointed lizard, and due to the rules of biological nomenclature that no two taxa can have the same name, Lawrence Lamb coined the term Eucentrosaurus for his animal, meaning true sharp pointed lizard to differentiate the two. This was unnecessary, however, as not only would Centrosaurus have priority over Kentrosaurus as it was named first, because the spellings were different, even if by only one letter they were considered distinct, making Eucentrosaurus an invalid name. Onto Centrosaurus itself, the horns and overall frill ornamentation look perfect. In addition to the huge nasal horn, it has the tiny brow horns as well. On the frill, the first pair of parietal spikes curve downwards from the front of the frill. The second pair strongly curve towards one another over the midline of the frill. The rest line the edges of the frill and gradually shrink towards the bottom. Across the three models, we have individual variation with the nasal horn with Centrosaurus and Eusebius. Centrosaurus curving forwards and Monoclonius is curving backwards. This variation is actually seen in specimens of Centrosaurus, which is really cool. I wonder if this was the reason they included these two dubious taxa, or perhaps they were short on ceratopsids and needed some that were easy to model from being so similar. The horn on the Centrosaurus model is really long, which I suppose is plausible seeing as we don't know how extensive the keratin sheath would have been in life. We actually have skin impressions from Centrosaurus, which consists of many smaller tuberculate scales occasionally interrupted by considerably larger tubercles. However, this model appears to have more wrinkled skin. The overall accuracy is hard to judge because of the variation and being split into three models, but to generalize all of the models as just one, it's great. Next up, we have another possible case of synonymy with Brachyceratops. Its name means short horned face and is only known from juvenile specimens discovered in Montana in rock dated to around 74 million years ago. As such, it is considerably smaller than other ceratopsids and only has small horns which are correctly reconstructed here, with a broad nasal horn and a pair of tiny brow horns. It's possible the five known specimens of Brachyceratops represent juvenile specimens of already named adult ceratopsids. The incompleteness and lack of diagnostic features of many of the specimens has made many researchers consider it a dubious genus. Regardless of its validity, this model is an excellent reconstruction. In 2011, the most mature and complete specimen was assigned to the genus Rubiosaurus, which in 2020 was itself synonymized with the next dinosaur we'll be looking at. Styracosaurus, meaning spiked lizard, has shown considerable variation in recent years in terms of head ornamentation. As such, this makes judging its accuracy difficult. For the time though, it looks to be perfect, except maybe for the nasal horn which may curve forwards rather than backwards. And the first pair of parietal horns which protrude out the front of the frill may be too large. The other parietals form four pairs of huge spikes that gradually shrink the further from the midline of the frill before transitioning into the smaller episquamosals. It also seems to have some spikes protruding from its back. I don't think these are the feather-like quills that some later researchers research suggested ceratopsians may have had, so I'm guessing they were just added to look cool. Considering Styracosaurus is now known to be so variable, judging it as a generic Styracosaurus, it's pretty solid for the time. Next is Ineosaurus. Its name means bison lizard, and it lived in Montana roughly 74 million years ago. It looks to be perfect, honestly. Its signature downward curving nasal horn is present, and its two large parietal spikes look correct too. 
it looks to have been given rows of small osteoderms down its back, or perhaps they're just large tubercles. Skin impressions aren't known for this genus, so it's impossible to critique this. Overall though, this one's pretty great too. Next is Achillosaurus, meaning Achillos lizard, after Achillos from Greek mythology, who could shapeshift and lost a fight to Hercules as a bull, and lost one of his horns. This refers to the perceived trend of some centrosaurines losing their horns over time in favour of flat nasal bosses, as seen in this animal. It lived in Montana roughly 74 million years ago. This one looks perfect too, both its bony nasal boss and sideways curving parietal spikes look spot on. Another home run. Speaking of nasal bosses, the last centrosaurine is Pachyrhinosaurus, meaning thick-nosed lizard. There are several species of Pachyrhinosaurus, and they lived from roughly 73 to 68 million years ago in Canada and Alaska. I'm pretty confident this is meant to represent P. lacustae, due to the spikes protruding from the frill, which is only known from that species. The other parietal spikes on the frill also resemble that species, with the first pair curving towards the midline of the frill, the second pair curving outwards on the top edges of the frill, before transitioning into much smaller spikes. This model does have some peculiarities. The nasal boss is very tall, most likely based on the theory of their bosses forming the bases of large keratin horns, like those of rhinos, which has since fallen out of favour. The body also looks to be covered in large turtle-like scales. While skin impressions aren't known for this animal, no dinosaur is known to have had scales quite like this. Overall, I'd say this is one of the weaker Ceratopsian models. The first Chasmosaurine we'll be looking at is, fittingly, Chasmosaurus itself. It lived in Canada roughly 76 million years ago. Its name means opening lizard, after the large openings in its frill called fenestrae. This model most likely represents C. belli, based on its brow horns and somewhat heart-shaped frill. The parietals are also correct, with the largest being at the top corners and curving outwards and gradually shrinking as they go down. We also have skin impressions from this animal, and it should have really large tubercles surrounded by many smaller ones, but they seem to be absent here. It's great on the whole though. Next is Pentaceratops, which despite its name meaning five-horned face, it only possessed the three horns of most chasmosaurines. Its name comes from its unusually large cheek spikes, called epijugals, which resembled the larger horns. Whilst many species have been referred to this genus since its initial description in 1923, the only definitive species, P. sternbergii, lived from 76 to 73 million years ago in the southern United States. The only issue I can discern are the epiparietals, as the first pair seem to just erupt out of the frill, when most reconstructions I've seen show them further up, closer to the next pair and pointing more to the sides. The others are correctly uniform down the rest of the frill. Otherwise though, it looks great. Next is a rhinoceratops, which lived in Canada 70 million years ago. Its name means no nose horn face, as when it was first discovered, its describer, William Parks, believed it was unique, as its nose horn was not a separate bone to the rest of the skull, not realising that that was normal for ceratopsids. This model does reflect how oddly tall this genus's snout is. Unfortunately, this is the first ceratopsid whose frill seems to be the wrong shape. It's been restored here as a rough trapezium or trapezoid, whereas its frill was actually quite low and square. The parietal spikes are at least correctly small and uniform. The brow horns also look to be too straight when they should curve to the sides quite strongly. Not the best reconstruction of this animal, unfortunately. The next genus, Anchiceratops, lived in Canada around 72 million years ago. Its name means near horned face, and it looks very similar with a mostly square frill and outwards curving brow horns, reconstructed correctly this time, however. 
the parietals seem to be correct as fairly uniform conical spikes around the entire frill. The nose horn curves backwards, however most other reconstructions I've seen show it curving forwards, and in my personal opinion, the horn core on the skull looks like a forwards curve is more likely, but this is purely speculative. This one is great on the whole. Next we have the most famous of the group, Triceratops, whose name of course means three-horned face, and it lived 68 to 66 million years ago in North America. This genus also represents both Chomp and Maximus in the anime. Speaking of, Chomp seems to most closely resemble Triceratops Horridus due to the length of his brow horns, however it's also possible he is the former species T. Maximus. It could just be coincidence, but considering his owner, Max's full name would also be Maximus, as well as the spectral space pirates owning an altered Triceratops with the same name. This reconstruction shows very standard brow horns. More recent research has suggested the keratin sheath in life could have curved in some extravagant ways but the more standard straight horns are also still plausible. The frill shows small, uniform parietal spikes. I've seen conflicting sources on whether adult Triceratops had spiky or smooth frills, so I won't critique this model on that front. In 2016, skin impressions from the mummified specimen called Lane showed that Triceratops had crocodile-like scoots on its underbelly and small pebbly scales interrupted by larger nipple-like scales on most of its body. For the time, however, this is excellent. Next we have a very interesting dinosaur, first referred to by the name Diceratops back in 1905, meaning two-horned face. This name was already occupied by a parasitic wasp. As of 2007, the skull that name referred to discovered in Wyoming, in rock dated to 67 million years ago, is now known as Nidoceratops, meaning insufficient horned face. However, this is a controversial genus, as many researchers consider it a strange specimen of Triceratops, with very vertical brow horns and lacking a nasal horn, possibly a result of disease, injury or growth defect. As such, it looks almost exactly like the Triceratops model, but with the aforementioned features. For what it is, it honestly looks pretty spot on to the fossil material, valid genus or not. The last lightning dinosaur is another that's occasionally being considered synonymous with Triceratops, Taurosaurus. It lived from 68 to 66 million years ago in North America. Contrary to popular belief, its name does not mean bull lizard, but rather perforated lizard, after its large frill fenestrae. Some researchers have theorised that Taurosaurus represented adult specimens of Triceratops, however most see it as a distinct genus. This model appears to be Taurosaurus latus, based on the more heart-shaped frill, which is coloured very vibrantly, which is very plausible if they were indeed mainly for display, almost looking like false eyes. The frill appears to curve slightly towards the top, whereas it should be straight. It is correctly shown without parietal spikes though. The horns, however, might be too straight and short. The scales are really strange and similar to the Pachyrhinosaurus in being really big. It's very odd. On the whole, not the best Taurosaurus model, but it could be a lot worse too. Dinosaur King's lightning element, on the whole, has stood the test of time fairly well in terms of accuracy. It's worth noting that a few of the Ceratopsid genera have since been synonymized, or already had been by the time the models were made, which is really weird that they still chose to make them as distinct models. However, I see this not as the fault of the Dinosaur King team, but more so the nature of Ceratopsids and how researchers have long distinguished them based on their head ornaments, which in recent years have been shown to be less reliable in this regard, showing a lot of variability, not helped by a lack of good skeletal material for some species. I'd also like to thank my good friend the Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow paleo YouTuber, the Casual Prince Ace, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.